Welcome. So uh, before we begin, obviously I'd like to acknowledge that we meet today on the traditional lands of the Rwandari people of the Kulin Nation, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. We also pay our respects to Torres Strait Islanders and members of the Aboriginal community that may be here in the audience today. Um, so uh, this is a really happy occasion. This is uh, Katerina Strake's um, completion seminar. Katerina has been with me now for about three years. Um, working, as she'll tell you, on a, a PhD developing a number of different tools that could be used in resource poor settings, looking at gastrointestinal worms and their impact on child development. Um, Katerina has been a fantastic member of the community, uh, and of the, the lab community, I should say, as well as the institutional one. She's regularly moving furniture all over the place um, and getting well paid for it. Um, and um, has uh, started out, I guess, previously I knew her, I met her, she had done a, a master's degree and in part placement with a, a good friend of mine who I'd done my PhD with, a guy named Nathan Bott, who's at RMIT University. And he told me about this um, student that he had that wanted to learn metagenomics and, and molecular biology and, and was really, really well, uh, uh, you know, really great student who was really self-motivated and everything else. And then um, she came across and was going to do a developmental biology degree in Norway. I think it was Norway. Uh, and um, made the worst decision of her life when she decided not to do that. Um, and did a PhD with me instead. But then it worked out well because she met her partner Adam and you wouldn't have done that otherwise. So, you know, <laughs> silver linings. Um, it's been a fantastic journey. I'm really pleased with the work that Katarina has done and I hope you'll enjoy the presentation she gives today and, and we'll uh, congratulate her afterwards on an extremely well-deserved uh, effort of last year. So please take it away, Katarina. All right, this is working. Thanks, Aaron, for the introduction. Um, can you all hear me fine? Cool, awesome, let me get started. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming because it's technically a long weekend. Um, so I really appreciate you all being here. Um, so as Erin already mentioned, I'm gonna talk really broadly speaking about the impacts of helmet infections in different populations from Southeast Asia. So helmet infections or cell transmitted helmets belong or are one of the 17 infectious species which are the neglected tropical disease or NTDs for short. And these are comprised of those four areas you can see here, the protozoa, bacteria, viruses, and helmet infections. And they cause a really significant global disease burden of more than 5 million disability adjusted life years, which ranks number six just below um, respiratory diarrhea infections and HIV. And the disability adjusted life years take into account the life years an individual has lived with the disease, as well as the life years that are lost due to early death. And of the um, neglected tropical disease itself, the salt transmitted helminths, namely roundworms, whipworms, and hookworms, um, comprise or have the highest global prevalence with more than five, six, and 700, or six and 800 million infections worldwide, which is why we're interested in studying these infections. So salt transmitted helminths, or STHs for short, which I'm gonna call them throughout my talk, uh, consists of these three species here, the roundworms, Ascaris lambricoides, the ribworms, Trichuris trichera, and then the hookworms, which are three different species, Niceta americanus, as well as Ancelosoma species. They occur predominantly, as you can see here on this world map, in really remote, tropical, um, overcrowded, and impoverished regions of the world, where they cause a significant global disease burden of around 1.5 billion infections, as well as two thirds of the global population are at risk of infection at any given point. And it definitely wouldn't be a parasitology talk, this doesn't work. Wouldn't be a parasitology talk if I didn't show you gross videos of some worms in a lab. Kudos to Joy who took this video during her honors. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so as you can see here, the life cycle, this really complex life cycle of the different SDH species really contributes to a significant and wide range of symptoms, which is in a way that a scarce or tricurious embryonated eggs are ingested into the host via contaminated food or water. The eggs travel then into the intestines where they develop into adult worms. In the case of Ascaris, they have an internal life cycle where they penetrate or the larvae penetrate the gut wall, travel over the liver towards the lungs, are coughed up and re-swallowed. And then in the gut, they reproduce where the fertile female worm then excretes many, many thousands of eggs which are passed back into the environment via the feces. In the case of hookworms, these eggs develop in the soil and the larvae enter the um, host not by ingestion but by penetrating the skin when people walk around bare feet and they reach the bloodstream that way. So I hope you can really appreciate that 
this really complex life cycle causes a wide range of acute symptoms, mainly malnutrition um, due to the competition for nutrients in the gut, then pneumonia, pneumonia and coughing um, due to this internal life cycle over the lungs, um, abdominal pain and diarrhea, mainly due to really intense heavy infections as well as whipworm infections, and then um, as well as iron deficiency anemia due to an internal blood loss when the hookworms um, attach to intestinal villi and suck your blood. And these symptoms are really um, significant in particular in subpopulations such as young children where they then can lead to stunting, wasting and also an impaired cognitive development long term. The distribution within a population is over dispersed, so that means that the majority of a population harbors really low intensity infections and there's only a few individuals who have or have these really significant high intensity infections. And the intensity of the infection is measured in X per gram or EPG um, using a microscopy based tool measuring the eggs that are excreted with the feces. So as I already mentioned, this is a microscopy-based tool, which is the um, WHO-recommended gold standard, um, which we use for diagnosing those infections. And this tool uses a small amount of fecal matter, which is spread on a cover slip, a slip and then examined by a microscopy. And I hope you can appreciate that this is really um, a really cost-effective um, tool because it requires little resource and is especially um, applicable in those remote settings where those infections occur. But obviously looking at large cell cohort studies, this is a real time consuming, um, time consuming diagnostic tool as well as requires this parasitological expertise because those eggs need to be um, morphological differentiated. And the most severe drawback is really the low sensitivity because the eggs are uh, excreted at irregular intervals by the worm. Um, this really leads to significant underestimation of the true infection prevalence. Um, and comparing the cut cuts to other, to other microscopy-based tools, again, highlighting really um, the low sensitivity as well as the sensitivity um, differs between different SCH species, which is why we've seen this move towards molecular tools, such as a qPCR LAMP assay or the mtPCR, which I'm going to talk about today. Um, and using those tools, we've seen a significant increase in the sensitivity. But again, I want to highlight here that the sensitivity still correlates or differs between different SCH species. But overall, it is better compared to a microscopy-based tools. But again, as you can imagine, also those molecular tools have limitations, which is mainly at the current point in time, the expertise and the cost as well as the resources required um, to use these, which limits them to research settings at this point in time. Um, another drawback is that we don't have a um, gold standard we can compare them to because the gold standard is the microscopy-based tool. And then obviously a sample degradation because there's typically no research facilities in the endemic area. Um, that implies that the samples need to be shipped nationally or internationally. And because we're dealing with fecal samples, this obviously leads to a sample degradation. So there's really a global need um, currently to have a really rapid high sensitivity tool and preserve those samples effectively so that we can then target or identify those low intensity infections and sustainably reduce the worm burden. So what global interventions exist at the moment? These are the mass drug administration, or MDA, as well as water sanitation and hygiene or wash interventions. The mass drug administration was proposed by the WHO in 2012, and that aims to target or treat 75% of preschool and school age children until 2020, which are 873 million children worldwide until next year. Depending on the intensity of infection, they are treated with an annual or biannual dose of benzamidazoles. And using this really high pressure treatment regime, we've already seen a decrease in infection prevalence from 2006 to 2017. But again, you can see that the infection prevalence globally is still very, very high. And because at this point in time, because we're only targeting those subpopulations of children um, using the MDA treatment, we cannot interrupt the transmission cycle and that then implies that we need interventions such as the WASH interventions, which provide access to safe drinking water to more than 600 million people who currently don't have access to any safe drinking water, as well as provide um, sanitation and then also education about good hygiene practices. Um, 
There have been a few randomized clustered trials um, evaluating the effectiveness of those wash intervention in combination with MDA co compared to MDA only. But again, there have only been a handful around 10 of these studies and there have been different effects seen. So really this area needs further investigation because we don't see a clear effect of those, study, um, of those interventions yet. So what are the current, the main current challenges? The main current challenges are really, as I highlighted, a microscopy diagnosis, which really underestimates the true infection prevalence. Then this high pressure mass drug administration regime raises this concern of potential emergence of drug resistance, because we've already seen a drop in drug efficacy. And then um, low intensity roundworm infections are typically asymptomatic. And these again provide an environmental reservoir that then just feeds into an ongoing transmission of the disease. So in a perfect worm-free world, we would hopefully have um, these targeted screen and treat programs. So we would have a really sensitive and fast um, diagnostic tool to um, identify individual low intensity infections and then apply a personalized treatment regime. Um, and in order to then interrupt the transmission, we would need to administer those wash interventions and then ultimately obviously have an improvement of socioeconomic status in those regions of the world. So this is where my PhD comes in. So I'm just gonna highlight the three aims of my PhD which were firstly to develop a molecular or a novel molecular diagnostic tool, screening uh, fecal samples for SDH infections. The second one was then um, to compare three different preservation methods um, to preserve fecal samples until they can be diagnosed or processed. And in that context, I've also looked at alterations in the gut microbiome caused by the infection. And then lastly, I've developed a sequencing tool to screen for drug resistance. And I'm gonna talk about each of these aims um, in a moment. So we've used these aims and um, applied them in the context of four population studies or cohort studies, which I wanna highlight here. So we've worked with populations from Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Timor-Leste. And really, um, I wanna highlight the collaborators that have provided us either with samples or set up the studies with us. And again, I'm gonna highlight each of these studies um, when I talk about each of the aims, but overall you can see we just had different types of SDH infections in different countries, different types of drug administration, and um, also different types of studies. Um, why Southeast Asia? Because Southeast Asia is still one of the SDH hotspots. So in 2011, in this review um, published by Aaron, we could see, still see high prevalence of, in certain countries of, um, of SDH, so up to 80% in certain regions. And fast forward to 2018, in combination all of those 12 Southeast Asian countries, we still see um, more than two mil 200 million Ascaris and Trichuris infections, and the majority of those infections is actually harbored in school-aged children. Again, highlighting that there's a significant amount of infection to date. In saying that, when we look at the intensity of infection on the x-axis here for each of the three different species, this highlights that we have a high prevalence, as seen on the y-axis, but intensity of infection has reduced due to this ongoing drug treatment. And again, this highlights that we need more sensitive diagnosis to actually identify those low-intensity infections. So this brings me to my first aim, where we developed a molecular diagnostic tool. And our hypothesis, as I already highlighted, was really just to improve the sensitivity of this diagnostic tool, um, accurately detect those low intensity infections, and then also importantly, to differentiate um, the hookworm or Ancelostoma species. There are two Ancelostoma duodenale and Cellulicum, and they are not, um, you can't differentiate them by microscopy. So we're really hoping to have species specific primers there and be able to differentiate those two. And the results of this chapter has been published earlier this year, and NTD, and I'm going to show the results of um, this study on the next couple of slides. So the assay that we use is called a multiplexed tandem qPCR or mtPCR, as I'm going to refer to, which we've um, developed in collaboration with Os Diagnostics, a company based in Sydney. 
And this utilizes a two-step PCR approach. So in the first step, um, each sample is enriched for eight gene targets using universal primers, um, using a semi-automated liquid handling robot. Each sample is then to split into eight individual gene targets. And then again, um, a second PCR is applied using species-specific nested primers. And then at the end, you apply a melt curve for high-resolution melt curve analysis, sorry, um, to then call presence or absence of each of the gene targets. And as you can imagine, this obviously implies that we have a really high sensitivity tool because we have this nested primer approach, we are more likely to um, detect um, low intensity infections. It is very cost effective and rapid because you can multiplex 24 samples and screen each of those for eight gene targets at the same time. Um, and then on the next slide, I'm gonna show you how user friendly this tool is, if that video works. Oh. So you can see the, um, as I set up up here with the different plates um, in the video, I show only a, one of the prototypes. If it works, maybe not. No. Yeah, so it's basically one of those um, little enclosed box. You can you re-sterilize it, you load your 24 samples and we'll run um, the first PCR for you, split each of the reactions of the first PCR and you can then transfer the plate you're using into the light cycler for the second PCR and the high resolution melt curve analysis. So I really just wanna highlight the user friendliness of the tool with this video. And the essay that we developed um, used these um, eight gene targets, and I'm gonna highlight or talk about the first five today. We also included strongyloides, which is another intestinal parasite, but I'm not gonna touch on that today. Okay, so for essay validation, I, I and Camille, during her honors, we initially started screening 462 um, samples from Timor-Leste in duplicate, and then tested the disagreements in triplicate. Um, because we only had a low number of disagreements, we then went on to do the total assay validation using the 302 Cambodian samples. So overall, we found a relatively high infection prevalence in both of those cohorts. So in this bar plot here combined, the Timor Leste and the Cambodian cohort, you can see that we see have an infection prevalence of more than 50% um, using the empty PCR in gray, and a, as a comparison, a qPCR um, assay in black here. The predominant species in Cambodia were Nicada, which had a higher infection prevalence than Timor-Leste, where the predominant species was Ascaris. And overall, we could see that our MT-PCR in comparison to the QPCR detected a slightly lower number of infection-positive samples. I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. When we look at the correlation of the two tools, you can see that we have a very nice correlation in terms of CT values for the MTPCR and the QPCR for both of those predominant species, which was above 0.8 R squared. Um, for Tricurus and Ancelosoma species, these were slightly lower simply because we don't have as many infection positive samples for those species. We were also able to detect a wide range of infection intensity, as you can see here in terms of G copy number, which is the assay output that um, tool gives us. The problem here is, or one of the limitations is that at this point in time, um, there have been a few attempts to convert this gene copy number into the X program measure to identify the intensity of infection, but such a conversion formula currently doesn't exist. Um, so we are currently not able to translate that. So when we looked at the performance of our tool, we want to look at the kappa or inter-radar reliability, which is a statistics that compares two radars, or in our case, the two diagnostic methods. Um, as you can see on this chi square table up here. So comparing the MT-PCR, um, it detects a positive infection, for example, and a negative one versus the QPCR gold standard. And you can see that we have a large proportion of those are true positive or true negative samples where both of those tools agree. Um, those two samples, which were presumably false positive, were resequenced via Sanger sequencing, and we found them to be indeed positive. And then those 46 that were false negative, I retested via qPCR again, and we found that majority of those had CT values um, of more than 30 or 35, which implies or deems them infection negative. And we hypothesized that we saw a sample degradation here because the samples that we had from Timor-Leste and um, Cambodia had been stored as extracted DNA for several years and had been frozen and thawed more than 10 times. So we see similar results. This is a table combining any of the SDH infections and we see similar results when we split them into each of these different species. 
When we then look at the kappa statistics, which I've shown here, so kappa is calculated or has a range from zero to one, where zero is a very poor agreement and one is a perfect agreement. You can see that all of our tests are above 0.8, so have a very good agreement, and three of them are above 0.9, which is very pleasing. Um, the same, we see very high uh, numbers for specificity, again, above 99.6%. So in summary, I hope I've shown you that we've developed a very user-friendly and automated tool which agreed um, very well with the QPCI I say that we um, used as a gold standard in this case and obviously has an increased sensitivity to microscopy. In saying that, for further validation, we're really looking forward to test um, new fresh feces of fresh fecal DNA because we had to sample degradation, we really need to test more samples to further validate this. Um, then also look at the application in the endemic area where you ultimately want to use the tool, really try to apply it there and see how the acceptability in the community is. As well as then obviously we need to see a cost reduction to make it really accessible for those um, populations at risk. Because at this point in time it's really limited to research settings. And then as I already highlighted on one of the previous slides, um, we really need to be able to have this conversion formula so we can actually convert the gene copy number to X per gram to not just qualitatively um, look for the infection but also look at the intensity of infection. So this brings me to my second time, which was um, to compare three different sample preservation methods. And um, the main preservative that we're looking at that I'm going to highlight in a moment is DSS, and we're really hypothesizing that this may be an alternative um, to fresh throw or fresh freezing of samples, which is the standard for gut microbiome studies. Um, we worked or we applied this um, aim in the terms of a cohort study in Thailand, and we're really, because these kids had never been... Um, had never been screened for infection using molecular tools. We were really expecting that we see a very high prevalence of infection. And then when we look at the gut microbiome, that we see potential alterations due to the infection. So I just want to briefly introduce the gut microbiome. You probably all heard about this buzzword. Um, in a normal state, when you have a balance of pathogenic and commensal bacteria, you have this nice homeostasis and everything's well. Obviously, the gut microbiome is influenced by a wide range of environmental factors. In our case, um, the age, the nutrition, and the immune status are really, or immune system are really the important ones because it's been reported that if a child or a patient is infected with an helmet, this correlates with the age, with the children at high risk of infection. Um, the helminth, because it's a parasite, competes with the host for nutrients, so indirectly modif can modify the gut microbiome this way. And then it also downregulates um, the immune system because it induces a Th2 response and in order to survive in the host. And again, this obviously then leads into this dysbiosis or imbalance, which can, as I already mentioned on my first slides, um, negatively impact those, the brain or the cognitive development. So in order to compare those different preservatives, we did conducted a study with some collaborators in Thailand where we took um, collected samples from 273 um, Karen ethnic children from a refugee camp at the Thai Myanmar border. We preserved each of these samples um, three ways, in DSS, fresh frozen, and potassium dichromate. DSS is basically a homemade RNA lighter, which consists of DMSO, EDTA, and some sodium chloride. Fresh freezing um, at minus 20 or minus 80, if feasible, is the gold standard for microbiome studies. And then potassium dichromide had been used in the past um, for PCR-based diagnostics. Um, and then using those different samples, we sequence the 16S RNA gene using a standard traditional alumina MySec approach. And I'm going to show you the results of the initial trial cohort first, where I sequenced 48 samples using all three um, preservatives in order to determine which one is more um, effective or best. And then I'm showing you the total cohort using the um, preservative that performed the best, which as a spoiler is DSS. Um, so when we look at the epidemiology, screening all the samples using our traditional MTPCI assay, um, we had an even distribution of um, sex as well as age. The infection prevalence, again, was relatively high with 52% of children having um, an SDH infection. And the pre predominant species here were Ascaris with 39% of infections and Trichorus with 36% of infections. 
Um, what was really interestingly looking at those infections was that a large proportion of those were actually co-infections. So uh, many of these children have multiparasitism, so they're infected with a wide range of species, which again contributes to these, this range and the diversity of the symptoms. Um, I also then looked as a first step, um, compared the gene copy number that I got as an output from the MTPCR and tried to roughly correlate this to the egg count that we got from the microscopy based tool, the CATOCATS. And you can see here that obviously the higher the gene copy number, we have a higher egg count and that then correlates with a lower gene copy number to a lower um, egg count. And this might just be a first step in aiding to having a conversion formula and aiding in this translation. Um, just briefly highlighting the sensitivity and specificity, again, um, these values and also the couple values here are still showing a moderate agreement, but obviously they are lower and not as comparable because in this case we're comparing our MTPCR assay to the microscopy-based tool, which obviously doesn't agree as well. So when we sequence the gut microbiome, so now showing just the initial trial cohort, which was 48 samples. Um, we can see that when we look at just the total number of positive infections, we see that the DSS and potassium dichromide preserved um, samples detect uh, the highest number of positive infections over the fresh frozen ones. When we then look at the relative abundance of the bacterial phyla, we see, again, the predominant phyla were typical enteric phyla that you find in any healthy individual, so predominant species being the Firmicutes, Bacteroidetes, and Proteobacteria. Um, when we compare the three different preservatives down here, I want to highlight those pie charts, you can see that we see no significant difference there. And the same is true when I looked at the alpha diversity, which is the diversity within a sample. Again, comparing the three different preservatives, there was no difference. Um, we did see a difference in the beta diversity. So when we look at that, um, the beta diversity is the diversity among different samples. We see that the potassium dichromate and DSS preserved samples have a slightly higher diversity compared to a fresh frozen standard. So what I really want to highlight on this slide is the DSS is the most, um, I guess, the most suitable preservative for those fecal samples because generally it is assumed that the more diverse a gut microbiome, the better. And DSS was able to preserve or show us the highest diversity in terms of a gut microbiome as well as being the cheapest and safest um, preservative to use because potassium dichromate is toxic in high concentrations. So we then went on and sequenced the entire cohort using the DSS preserved samples only. And again, I just want to highlight a bar plot here. So when we look at the um, overall bacterial phyla that we found, again, the same um, predominant species with Firmicutes bacteroidetes, there was no difference there. And when we looked at um, if these um, bacterial phyla were different among um, environmental variables, so the sex, the age, we found no difference there. When we looked at the alpha diversity, as a reminder, diversity within a sample, um, surprisingly found that non-infected or uninfected children compared to the infected ones had no significant difference in alpha diversity. And the same was true when we compared um, for sex or the age. We found no difference there. Um, we did find a significant difference compared to the school, which may roughly um, relate or translate to a geographical location, but obviously this can be due to a lot of other environmental factors such as the diet or um, other health records and medication use as well. Then I again looked at the beta diversity, and um, as I already showed beforehand, um, looking at the alpha diversity, we saw a significant difference according to school as before. Um, now we also saw that the beta diversity, so the diversity again among the samples, um, was different depending on infection status. So infected children seem to have a higher beta diversity compared to the uninfected ones. But again, um, looking at sex or age, we again found no significant difference there. So overall, I hope I've shown you that DSS was a real um, effective, non-toxic and cheap preservative and may be um, um, suitable to be used for microbiome studies in the future. Um, looking at um, alterations in the gut microbiome caused potentially by the SDH infections, we found no difference in the alpha diversity. We did see a difference in beta diversity, which has been reported in the past by other people as well. 
So for, to further validate this um, preservative, we really need to test this on ambient temperatures because we currently had it on a cold chain at four degrees. So in the future, we're really looking forward to um, test this on ambient temperatures and also using different time frames potentially to see if that impacts um, how many parasites or infections you detect. Um, we then obviously need to screen a larger and hopefully as well um, longitudinal um, cohort in order to really see the ongoing impact those infections have on the gut microbiome. And in saying that, um, at this point in time, um, seeing no difference in the alpha diversity may simply be due to the fact that when we sampled, um, we obviously compared uninfected versus infected children, but those uninfected children may have been infected in the past where we don't have the health records. So what we really need to do is compare children that have never been infected versus those that are infected from the same population to really see an effect of those infections. All right, that already brings me to my um, last aim, which was um, to develop a sequencing tool to screen for drug resistance. Because the WHO, and as I highlighted in my introduction, proposed this high-pressured MDA treatment regime, we really um, is an increasing concern that you see emergence of drug resistance. Um, there's been reports from animal cohorts, which I'm going to highlight again on a couple of next slides, um, that the codons 167, 198, and 200 of the beta tubulin gene are causal for drug resistance. Um, and we were looking forward to sequence those three codons of um, three populations, again from Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam, to uh, look for drug resistance. And we're obviously expecting that when we compare populations that have never been treated to those that have received drug treatment for um, long time that we see a difference in frequency there. So benzamidazoles um, as a main um, drug intervention, uh, drug, yeah, drug intervention um, here, albendazole and mebendazole, they block the GTP binding region of the beta tubulin here. And that means that beta and alpha tubulin cannot dimerize appropriately anymore. That means that also microtubule assembly is um, disrupted in a cell. Um, and that then leads to an impaired glucose uptake. So it means that the larvae or the adult worms simply starve and the eggs of those worms um, have a disrupted metabolism, which is how those um, drugs work. Um, in animal or in livestock, the animal cohorts, we've seen drug resistance since many, many decades. In the 50s, there was the first report of drug resistance um, in uh, Hermonchus contortus, and by the 2004, we've seen a multi-drug resistance against all three classes of anthelmintics, and then earlier this year, there's basically resistance on most of the continents, uh, continents on the world. Um, in, in, in those cohorts or the livestock populations, um, these codons, as I already mentioned, 167, 198, and 200, have been shown to be causal for drug resistance. This is why there's like an increase in concern now that this, we see the same mutations in human populations, because the same drugs are used for drug treatment. So what's the evidence for drug resistance in humans? When we uh, look at or compare two reviews um, published in 2008 and 2017, we see a significant reduction in cure rates, in particular here for whipworm infections, as well as hookworm infections when they're treated with mebendazole. And that means the cure rate is um, the amount of people that clear the infection after you treat them with drugs. And as you can appreciate, we see this significant drop, and that then increases the concern that this may be caused um, by drug resistance. Drug resistance um, currently can only be diagnosed via microscopy during a fecal egg count reduction. So you um, screen for eggs pre, pre and post treatment and then see how much um, the um, reduction rate is. Um, because this is really um, resource, um, resource heavy or requires a lot of resources, this is really difficult to apply in human populations. Um, which is why there have been two papers from other um, researchers where they've tried to develop a molecular tool screening um, yeah, or sequencing those codons rather than needing to do those phenotypic studies of fecal egg count reductions. But overall, there has been no real conclusive evidence that drug resistance is evident yet in, uh, in human populations. It's only a concern. 
So what we did, we took the three cohorts, uh, cohorts we had from Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. They're infected with different types of um, SDH, so Trichuris and Agascaris in Vietnam, and then hookworm Nicada infections in Cambodia and Vietnam. And um, we sequenced those three cohorts. And I really want to highlight, um, in particular, the Cambodian one, where we had a baseline sample and then a three-day follow-up sample with a matched individual which retained the infection positive status at follow-up, implying that these may be resistant to drug, resistant to drug treatment. The Vietnam cohort had never received any drug treatment, which is why we then would assume that these have less... Um, are less likely to have those variations or have those mutations at those codons. Um, I then developed a amplicon sequencing assay, so using two sets of primer pairs targeting the different codons of the beta tubulin gene um, for each of those three species. I've then developed, um, with the help from Anna, his variant calling pipeline where we um, identified any variants or SNPs with a minimum variant frequency of 1%. So basically what you get as an output from the Illumina MySec, obviously you get your whole bunch of sequencing reads, um, you align them to a reference sequence. In our case, we only had this little, um, very small 300 base pair region. And VASCAN will call a consensus sequence from all of your sequencing reads. And we'll call a variant or a SNP at one position if this um, variant is, um, is present in more than one of percent of those, of all of your reads. And that's a number that you can define. Um, and then obviously in this case here, the frequency would be 20%, in the case of this SNP here, 60%. All right, so when we looked at the results from our sequencing, um, we sequenced a total of 376 samples. Again, as I highlighted, the three different cohorts and species, and we really had a really high um, sequencing read depth, which was really, um, really satisfying. Um, we called it quite a number of variants, but overall the frequency was quite low, which I'm again not going to highlight on the next slide, and this might highlight that we also have a low, um, low, um, yeah, low evidence for drug resistance. So when we look at each of these countries individually, so the indicator infections in Cambodia here, um, on this plot, you can see the um, base pair position um, of the gene of beta tubulin on the x-axis, and then the frequency on the y-axis. And each of these dots is a variant or a SNP um, that is called, that's different from the reference sequence. Um, the three codons that we're sequencing is all highlighted in those straight and dotted lines. So the codon 167, 198, and 200 here. And overall, you can see that at this baseline, um, Sampling time, but for all of the 66 samples we had there, there's only few, um, few variants that are actually called, and the overall frequency was quite low. The number of um, variants then increases to this three-day follow-up, as you can see here, but again, very low frequency. As obviously you can already see, um, one um, one variant at a position um, 99 here, where many of the samples call the variant. Um, and this may then be um, really interesting for further investigation to see um, if this, um, or phenotypic screens to see if this um, variant is, could also potentially cause drug resistance. But in saying that, um, I hypothesize that this is less likely um, to cause drug resistance because it's outside of a coding region, which is highlighted by this gray box here. And we see similar results um, when we look at the same infectious species, but from Vietnam. Again, um, very, low uh, very low number of variants as well as a low frequency. Um, overall, we can see, if you have a keen eye, you can see that we had a variant at the code on 9 198 here. However, that amino acid change was not the one that had been reported in the past, but it may be interesting for further investigation. And we see similar results when we um, look at the Trichuris infections as well as Ascaris infections. So you can already see overall that for trichuris infections, we have a quite a high allele, a very early frequency in this case, and many more SNPs. Um, we can see here that we have a variation at the codon 167 as well as 200. But again, as on my previous slide, that amino acid change was not the one that had been reported from livestock. But again, um, it may be used for other screens. 
And then um, overall, Ascaris uh, infections had really a low frequency and um, low number of um, variants compared to a reference. So just to summarize that, um, I successfully developed this amplicon sequencing approach, including a variant calling pipeline, um, to screen that region around the codons 167 to 200 for um, variants in human SDHs. Um, we detected three variants at the codons are highlighted. However, again, um, these were not the amino acid change that had been reported in the past. Um, so imply or show that we have low evidence for drug resistance in those populations. So in the future, we obviously are looking forward to would need to screen um, larger sample sets as well as potentially the whole genome sequencing because we are only looking at this really limited um, region of 300 base pairs around each of those codons. Um, whole genome sequencing might provide us with the ability to screen for other genes or other variants and SNPs that are associated or causal for drug resistance. Um, in terms of um, the emergence of drug resistance, this obviously requires the ongoing, ongoing monitoring of all the populations in order to detect it at an early stage. Um, yeah, and then overall, um, I just want to wrap up with this last slide um, because I know that all of my chapters are very technical heavy. Um, and I really want to highlight um, where we need to go in the future, not only in terms of the helmet infections, but in neglected tropical disease, I guess, more broadly, um, to really ultimately interrupt the disease transmission as well as reach and eradication of those species. Um, what's been really um, obvious throughout my PhD is that there's no common or standardized um, study design or, um, yeah, study or sampling design. So we really um, need this common strategy and work together and have a global effort to target those infections. Again, highlighting that we need a standardized study and sampling to design to make those studies comparable, which at this point in time is really not available. Um, as I highlighted, um, the current treatment regime predominantly targets pre- and school-aged children, which again, as you can imagine, has other um, host reservoirs. So if, and, or if adults are infected, there's further um, or ongoing transmission. So it really needs to have, to have this extended treatment coverage to other populations or groups at risk. Um, and then this again feeds back into that we need um, wash interventions um, and really an improvement of the socioeconomic status to really ultimately reach an eradication and um, um, disease transmission interruption. And then I also want to highlight that we really need to find ownership of the control programs because it's been evident that um, in many of these programs, um, drugs are donated free of charge for a number of years, but this typically ceases after a couple of years. But the X or the SDHX can survive in the soil for many years. So after the drug treatment um, ceases, we usually see a resurgence of infection. Um, Again, a lot of these data are on a national scale, and that's been really obvious that we need subnational data. For example, the population of the refugee children that I worked with, um, where there wasn't really any data available for such populations. And then ultimately, um, there have been a few papers that looked at using a combination treatment, so combining different drugs in order to combat this potential emergence of drug resistance. All right, and with that, I come to my acknowledgements, which is a fun part of talk, I guess. Um, I really, first and foremost, would like to thank all, I know they're not here, but obviously thank all the participants and their families. Without all the field teams and the samples that are donated to us, none of this would have been possible. Um, I would like to thank my PhD committee, obviously Aaron, for the nice introduction. <laughs> um, Thank you so much for taking a chance on me and giving me the opportunity to, to do a PhD in your lab. And I know a PhD is not always easy. There's a lot of ups, ups and downs, but it was amazing nonetheless, and I wouldn't have wanted to have done it anywhere else. Um, I want to thank Harreen and Len for being on my committee um, and really providing me with a lot of support and guidance. And then in particular, Rebecca and Melanie, who are in the audience today. Um, you guys have the most incredible workload, and I have no idea how you ever had time to listen to me. And <laughs> I'm not going to lie, if it wasn't for Rebecca and Melanie having an open door, I would not be giving my seminar today.
Okay, and I'm not going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, then I obviously want to thank the entire Jax Lab, in particular Luis and Sam. I'm pretty sure that the lab will be less um, pretty quiet without me, and <laughs> I really appreciate all the non-scientific chats we had. Um, the entire Jax Lab, as well as a particular joint Camille, um, former lab members, um, Stephen for letting me semi semi run my own sequencing rather than taking it over from me, which was, he had a lot of trust in me, I think. Um, I want to thank Alex, Anna, Brendan, and Jacob so much for all the bioinformatics advice. I know I was a pain in the ass sometimes, but at least I can kind of run my own stuff now, um, which is really fun. I want to thank Zoe, who started a PhD at the same time with me, and it's been really, really amazing to have a buddy um, to go through everything together. Um, by my, um, obviously Natalie, who's been currently on maternity, maternity leave, but who's basically the backbone of the entire division, um, and nothing would run without her. Um, I want to thank, obviously, our collaborators or anyone I've worked with. I'm sure I forgot people at the University of Melbourne and the whole field team in Thailand that I was lucky enough to go to the field with. Um, in saying that, I want to acknowledge the Australian Society for Parasitology, which is one of the most amazing societies a student can be part of. And they provided me, me with a travel grant, which helped me to travel to Thailand, to the refugee camp, and actually collect the samples with the field team, which was a really special um, trip. And then I want to acknowledge our collaborators at ANU, as well as OS Diagnostics, obviously, who I've worked um, closely with. And obviously, all of the funding bodies, all of the scholarships I received, um, as well as my um, mentor, Tony Redford, from the IMNIS program, who's been terrific support in, in, um, in terms of career advice. And then I have a more fun slide. Um, again, I want to thank you, Aaron, for always hyping my posters and all of the poo emojis I've ever put on stuff. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank WISA 2008-18. You guys were the most incredible crowd, and it has been so much fun uh, working with you, and it's just made being at WEHI so much more amazing. Um, the WEHI book club, I forgot to mention, because it forced me to read other stuff than just papers. Um, again, the ASP and all the people that I uh, met on the Concepts in Parasitology course where I attended, which really have become lifelong friends, um, and I really appreciate all of their support. Um, and I again want to highlight also the um, LEAD program from the Graduate Student Association here at the university which were terrific um, support. Again, the whole lab, all the vet faculty people who make conferences so much more fun. And then last but not least, I want to um, acknowledge my parents um, and my siblings and my partner for all the support. All right, and I'm happy to take any questions. Ten minutes. Um, Ten minutes. Plenty of time for questions. Would we be surprised if you'd went over time? I think we would. <laughs> Anyone like to start with some questions? Robbie. Okay, David. Thank you so much, Kat. I throw it. Do you, do you think there might be any parasite-host interaction that might be going on with uh, drug resistance? Parasite-host interaction? Mm -hmm. In terms of genome. I mean, I, I guess it definitely could be the case. I'm not exactly sure if there has been any any research in that area, but obviously some of these worms directly attach to the host, so some of them actually attach to your intestinal cells. Um, so I guess it could definitely be possible, but I'm unsure if there's been any any research done in that area, actually? Yeah, I, mean, I think I had a... Oh, yes, please. Go for it, Anna. I had a similar question to the one that Robbie had, so I would, would wonder, could you look at this link to see if you have any resistance, but is there anything else that you can think of, or like as, as people look at something else, or...? Why we see the drug, uh, yeah. I mean, again, we only we can only look at the drug, um, the curates, right, and we see this drop. But obviously, again, there can be many factors. There's compliance of taking the drugs. A lot of times people are not as compliant. There are heavy side effects those drugs cause. Um, not, not taking the full dose, things like that. Um, it doesn't necessarily 
need to be resistance, you know. Then there's obviously high rates of reinfection because you obviously treat the infection, but the eggs are in the soil, you most likely are constantly getting reinfected. So there's obviously many, many factors that contribute to this ongoing infection, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you about your philosophical slide uh, that you had about uh, you know yeah. using uh, similar kind of study designs or strategies for yeah. for elimination. But um, given what Alyssa's shown over the years with malaria, is that really feasible with different countries being at different stages? I mean, she's shown that very different uh, methodologies are, are needed. Yeah, I mean, of course, it's difficult to have a complete standardized global approach. Um, I, was, I guess I was more speaking in terms of um, at least moving uniformly then towards either, or at least having either microscopy-based diagnostics or molecular-based, because at the current point in time, it's very so different that basically oftentimes none of this is comparable. A lot of people use one preservative, someone else uses another one, and sometimes in the same country they use different techniques and different um, different studies designs. So really, it's really, really difficult to compare any of them. So when you look up those, like any review article, they're very just, it's hard to see any effect anywhere because it makes it so difficult to compare. Yeah. And that's why it's so hard to see any effect of the Bosch interventions as well. So I, um, there was a review earlier this year um, where they only identified 10 randomized cluster trials and it was really hard to see an effect because they were all so different and then using different types of interventions, it was just simply um, very hard to compare, yeah. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Still have time for questions. Wait another minutes. The SNP you saw that was different to the one that's normally uh, seen. What was the amino acid that could it be doing the same thing? Gosh, that's a good question. It was a different amino acid change. That's for sure. But obviously, in order to validate it, we need to do phenotypic screens. Could you just look at what the amino acid It's a very simple... Yeah, yeah, yeah I definitely could. I, I know they haven't been reported in the past, the change I saw. But again, that's a question if it's then causal. You definitely need to do further screens then to see if it actually has an effect on the efficacy. Yeah. Um, following on from Candy's question, then have you looked at any of the historical notifications No, unfortunately not. It's a good good idea. There's obviously a lot of open ends that we could further look into, but I haven't done that. No. This was really just a screen. If there's anything there, I'm really just doing initial screen. Um, that really big peak that you had that was outside of the COVID region, does that sorry did I miss that? Was that an interim peak or yeah, yeah. yeah. So could there be splicing variants? Potentially, yeah. That it's actually in the yeah. yeah, again, obviously, um, as I said, that was only initial screen. Um, we definitely need to further validate this. But I guess I would be careful with that because um, I actually spoke with to Anna about this. Um, it also depends on the reference sequence you use. So I used the ones that had been validated and basically most of the studies used. But when I looked up a different reference sequence for the same um, species um, from worm base that um, the other reference actually has that variant in there. So date, when I um, assemble it to that reference, it doesn't call a variant at that position. So again, I guess you have to be careful. Is that then, you know, just normal variation? Looking at which reference you use. So I, I think, yeah, definitely it's for investigation, but you have to be then also careful what you use in terms of calling your variants. Is there any difference in the alpha diversity in people who have one species of parasite versus multiple infections? That's a good question. I did not look at that, but should probably, yeah, should have a look at that. Well, I guess, I mean, overall, this, this, it's like, I guess, I assume I would probably not see a significant difference because otherwise I'd probably see an effect in my when I compared unaffected versus infected, because that would be a range, right? But I guess it would be an interesting thing to look at, but I didn't actually compare that. It's a good idea. Yep. Go for it. Um, <laughs> could you um, tell us a little bit more about your diagnostic, your MT-PCR? Yep. Um, did you ever look at the same um, 
the same subject, a sample from them at different times? Is there variability? Would you expect to see variability? So you mean a longitudinal study at the, um, yeah. in the populations? Yeah, or, if, or would, if yeah. you didn't do that, would you expect to see differences and how much? In terms of the, the tool or do you mean the infection status? Well, both. I assume I guess the both. infection status would then be yeah. Well, I guess overall you probably expect it always to be relatively... I guess there's always a number of infections there, so I wouldn't expect the infection numbers to um, change majorly. Obviously, after drug treatment, you expect it to when they get reinfected. Um, but obviously, it's hard to do, do those longitudinal studies. Um, we would have loved to do one. That was the initial plan of my PhD, to do a longitudinal study, um, which unfortunately fell through, um, to see an impact of the infection and also really look at the gut microbiome. Um, but it's just simply very difficult to do in endemic areas. Um, and obviously with the samples I have here, um, it would make an impact if we retest the same sample because obviously they're fecal samples and they're frozen and then freezing and thawing them multiple times again has an impact on then the diagnostic tool and what you see here. Jacob. Um, following on from that question, Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that the, the um, egg, egg per gram count was quite variable based on whether the parasite was shedding or not. Yeah. Would that be expected to follow, like, yeah. follow the DNA concentration as well? Yeah, yeah it, it definitely influences, and, and that's why we see this. That's why we assume that 1.5 billion is probably an underestimation as well. The true number is probably quite high. So typically what I did with the fecal samples um, when they were preserved, um, like you kind of um, centrifuge them to concentrate a poo and then decant supernate and then, then um, mix it again with water. And before you extract DNA, you also homo homogenize the entire sample to make sure that not, when you have your poo sample, you don't take the top bit and you might miss eggs or you might not. And it's, it's very variable. But obviously, again, you only take such a small sample of a gram or so from much bigger samples, <laughs> really. <laughs> Um, so obviously, there's, even with our tool, it's obviously it's more sensitive, but obviously due to the sample collection, the whole processing, we might miss, might miss some infections, yeah. One last question, and that'll teach Katarina not to finish early. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just have a quick question. You talked about um, like compliance of taking the medication. I was just wondering what the regime was or if there was any work on trying to better the way yep. it yeah, so the WHO one is the single dose, so depending on infection intensity, if, if the intensity, what was it, more than 50% um, or something, don't let me lie, um, you get a biannual dose, otherwise it's a single annual dose. Um, but I spoke to Rebecca, one of my um, supervisors, and she said they had, um, th in other co cohorts, I think they had a three-day treatment regime or two-day or something like that, where then it's hard to follow up with those days, um, especially if they have heavy side effects. So typically, obviously, the children don't like to take the drugs if they have side effects. Yeah. It's hard. That's why they administer it through those school-based system, where basically the teacher will go and give the child the drug and watch it take it, yeah, to really kind of make it more compliant. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Larry.